Welcome to the first ever God is Open podcast. Today we are going to be talking about the God is Open website. One of the first things that we have to do, especially with an introductory podcast like this, is explain what is open theism. One of the best open theist descriptions I've come across basically defines open theism as a reaction against the Greek influence in Christianity. Christianity from very early on was Platonized. These concepts that God is, you know, timeless and omniscient and and immutable, and omniscient in the sense that he like knows the entire future. Those are not ideas you get from the Bible, but you do find ideas like that in Greek philosophy. Because Greek philosophy was under the idea that God has to be the greatest good. And if you listen to these Calvinist sermons, they'll often talk with the same exact logic that Plato had in the Republic. They'll say, God is the greatest good. And if there's any change, the change cannot be for the better, so it has to be for the worse. So that means God is, he can't change. And they have to come up with this concept of this this absolutely simple creature existing outside of time and this sort of nothingness, like this ethereal existence. And that most definitely is not a Christian concept of God. It's not the biblical concept of God. And the philosophical open theists will argue that's not even a rational concept of God. So open theism is an attempt to divest Christianity from these platonic influences. So the primary claim of open theism is that it's not necessarily about uh, God has to have exhaustive foreknowledge of the future or, or even a rejection of that concept. It's the concept that, you know, God is the personal God that the Bible depicts. God in the Bible is often having conversations. He's often deferring to human beings, their ideas, and he allows their ideas to replace his ideas on what to do. You see God lamenting throughout the text when his people abandon and reject him. This is not a Calvinist concept. This is not a Platonic concept in which God is immutable and can't be grieved. The biblical God is often grieving, and it's often because humankind rejects him. So when the Calvinists claim that we can't give God anything, well, yeah, we can't just like make him a present or something like that, but he desires our relationship and our love. And when he doesn't get his worship that is due him, it actually takes a physical and emotional toll on God's state of being. God at one point says, I am weary of repenting. I keep not killing you guys, but I really should have, because you guys are just, keep rebelling. You keep rebelling. And I don't know what to do with myself. So open theism is the movement which says God is relational, God is personal, God is love, God has emotions, God is extremely mutable, he changes. And one of these aspects that belong to God is not like total foreknowledge of the future. That God's just not concerned about that in the Bible. If you read the Bible, that's not like one of the concerns. When people are trying to explain who God is and, and what God can do and what God means, it's not about knowledge. It's never about knowledge. Not even in, in the Isaiah 40 passage that the Calvinists often claim. It's all about power. It's all about who God is and what God can do and, and what God's thinking and what God's plans are and how you could avert certain plans it's, it's all relational. How do we reach and commune with God? And even eschatologically, all the claims we see throughout Isaiah and Daniel and Revelation is about this future existence with God, living with God. Revelation even uses the phrase that God will live with man. It's a relational existence. So why is open theism important? I mean, I like my free time. I got a bunch of kids. I could be hanging out with them. I could be playing video games, something like that. But why is it that I would dedicate a large segment of my free time to writing and talking about open theism? Well, it's because who God is is the most important question in life. It's more important than individual personal salvation or theories of atonement or 
theories of dispensationalism or baptism, but who is God? And from this question, who is God, all other theology is secondary. All other theology revolves around this one question of what is God like? And that's going to drive, you know, how we live our lives. Is who is this God that created us and what is he like? So back to the blog site. God is Open was created by me approximately two years ago, January of 2014, so we've been running for two years. We have daily posts on the subject of open theism. It's pretty much exclusively on the topic of open theism. Sometimes we'll touch on other related topics as uh, yeah, that are kind of tangential to the overall theme of open theism. The site itself was created in response to a Facebook discussion. On one of the Open Theist Facebook groups, they were talking about how there doesn't actually really exist a place where Open Theists can collaborate and, and where the different ideas can, you know, mix and present a balanced view, kind of like, of Open Theism. There are several sites that were kind of created in response to this. But those other sites have pretty much died, I think, from lack of uh, use. My site is still running. I try to keep it daily posts. I try to keep the subject matter interesting. And I try to present a variety, variety of views so that no one strand of open theism necessarily, necessarily takes dominance of that site. It's, it's supposed to act as, you know, kind of encompassing all the different open theist open theistic views out there not everything i post i agree with some of the things i post i disagree with but you know this sort of information should be out there and people who are evaluating open theism as a movement should be able to see the entire spectrum of beliefs and if they want to emerge into the open theism movement on the side of philosophical open theists or or on the side of biblical open theists, those are two different parties. Those are two different uh, people groups from which to draw people to become open theists. Not all philosophical people are going to like the biblical aspects of open theism. There's going to be people who think the Bible is an uninspired text. They're going to say, you know, the only way to true reason is philosophy. You know, if if you could take that path and get to the true nature of who God is, you know, more power to you. So that's why it's important to keep the philosophical side, but then you got the biblical side. The people who say, you know, I want to believe the Bible. Whatever the Bible says, that's what I'm going to go with. These are more of your fundamentalist type who want to take seriously the texts of the Bible. So I try to present those views as well. Um, people who actually read the Bible and try to understand the Bible for what it's saying, and then go into interpretation of the Bible. So myself, I would classify myself as a biblical open theist. And by that I mean people who try to read passages in the Bible and try to understand what the author was trying to communicate to their audience. This is a very important concept because in texts like, let's say, Exodus 32, we got Moses, and he's talking to God. He's having a conversation with God, and he convinces God not to destroy Israel. And the, re the reason that God does not destroy Israel is you don't get a sense that it's through, you know, just because Moses prayed or is predestined or something like that. Moses uses arguments. He uses a series of arguments. And God accepts these arguments. And when this text is looked back on throughout the Bible, it says that God did not destroy Israel because of Moses' arguments. It says God did it for his own sake. And what was his own sake? Well, Moses explained that to God. He said, do not destroy Israel because you will look terrible to these other nations. These foreign nations will see that you just took Israel, you brought them into the wilderness, and then you just killed them all. You know, God, that is not going to look very good on you. And God, he said, good point. So a philosophical open theist probably wouldn't like that text because, you know, it might suggest that God didn't have present knowledge or that God doesn't think of all things 
at all times in the forefront of his mind. You know, these weird philosophical concepts that they're, they're, not, they're not biblical concepts in the least. But if you're trying to build some sort of systematic theology where God is the greatest good, you know, those, those sorts of arguments appeal to you. The arguments which undermine the text in favor of systematic theology. And so that, that is the metric between biblical open theists and philosophical open theists. Philosophical open theists will try to build these overarching systematic theology with these well-defined attributes without flexibility that they attribute to God, and they don't really allow those attributes to change. So if God's like omnipresent or something like that, he can't necessarily not be omnipresent. It's just an inherent attribute. Yeah, it's just an inherent attribute, and any part of the Bible that it looks like God's not omnipresent. Let's take Genesis 18, where God says, this is Yahweh speaking, he says, I will go down to Sodom to see if the reports that have come to me, if those reports are true, and if not, I will know. So it's it's basically a go-find-out type of mission, but a lot of people have to reject the text in favor of their systematic theology because their systematic theology doesn't allow for a situation in which God has to go verify. So so when someone's discussing that text and they say, oh, th- that interpretation of those events cannot be right because that conflicts with my other notion that I get from perhaps a different proof text in a different part of the Bible by a different author, that's when I think to myself, that's not a biblical argument. That's a philosophical argument. Your philosophical argument is, you know, the Bible authors all have to agree with each other, and my particular proof texts that I really like have to override these other proof texts which I don't really like, and we have to interpret one in light of the other. You see this a lot in sermons by Greg Boyd, for example. He will say that the Old Testament acts attributed to God are not actually God's acts. Because God, he says, has to be interpreted in light of this Christological systematic theology in which all God's acts are kind of interpreted in light of Jesus and the cross. I mean, that it's I'm not going to say these are invalid methods, but they're not textually critical methods. And as such, they're not particularly appealing to myself. They might be appealing to other Christians, Christians who are persuaded or by more of the philosophical or systemological type of arguments. You might be able to say, well, the God of Calvin, that's not the real God because that would make him incredibly sadistic, you know, because God would be micromanaging all the evil in the world for some sort of pleasure, individual pleasure. Yeah, it sounds like sadism. And some Christians might be put off by sadism. But the text itself in the Bible, we can't be just operating under a presumption that the text doesn't present sadism as an attribute. You need to let the text speak for itself and not try to reinterpret the text in light of these attributes that you would like to ha- for the text to have. Now, it's not invalid to defend God from charges of sadism. For example, God throughout the Bible takes vengeance in various scenarios. The Greg Boyd method to this is to try to just override the text with some sort of systematic Christological theology. But it's perfectly valid to say, you know what, vengeance is not a bad thing. You know, in the Old Testament, there are people called avengers of blood. These are vigilantes that went out and they just they killed murderers and stuff like that. And this is not a bad thing. Uh, us modern people in America, where we live till 80 years old and we have almost non-existent child mortality, we, we're kind of living in a fantasy world where vengeance and righteousness and justice, we kind of can do away with those concepts because we don't really operate in the real world. And as such... Our notions of justice are kind of warped. You know, some sort of argument like that, that's that's valid to be made, but that's not necessarily an argument for or against open theism. That's just a defense of actions. So, in short, uh, 
that's that's how the ranking on the website works. The more that people appeal to overriding concepts of God as their interpretation metric for individual texts, the more they are shifted towards the philosophical spectrum, the end of the spectrum. When they say, oh, that's not true because that would mean God's not good, or that's not true because that would mean God's not XYZ attribute. That's not really a biblical argument. That's a philosophical argument. You could claim that it contradicts some sort of text. And that's only a really a problem when the contradiction's within the same author, because then you know you're probably misreading. Because often individual authors do not contradict each other. But separate authors writing at different time periods and different points of history, they could often write contradictions. But we can't just assume away those contradictions and try to use this trumping method where the text that we like trumps the text that we don't like. That's not the biblical way to do theology. Again, it's not wrong to use systematic theology. It's not wrong to use philosophical theology. And I try to emphasize this on my site. I post blog posts all the time using these philosophical arguments that appeal to the philosophically minded just myself, it, it, they just don't appeal to me very much. So if you are a philosophically minded as an open theist, uh, one of the things that this blog, God is Open, sets out to do is give a forum to all open theist voices, even dissenters, people who don't agree with open theism. They are welcome to contact me, and I'll put up articles by them. I'll put up articles by philosophical open theists. What we need is a dialogue. And a dialogue is sadly lacking in a lot of Christianity. People just don't like discussing and defending concepts. The more open communication we have, the closer we could get to real truth. This is one of the pillars of intellectual integrity, is an open and honest discussion. It's uh, not censoring ideas, uh, no matter how unpalatable this, these ideas might be but giving everything a fair consideration and trying to understand where people are coming from and what views they're trying to propose. So if you would like to write for God is Open, we fully welcome it. Just email me. Um, there's My email is in the About section, and it kind of also breaks down this explanation of what we're attempting to comp accomplish and who could publish and and we would love articles, short articles or long articles or anything that you would like to submit. We'd like to publish that. I'd also like to point out we have a companion Facebook group called God is Open. Just put it all in, all one word, God is Open. And it should be the first thing that comes up on Facebook. We also got links to the Facebook group on the actual blog page, GodIsOpen.com. So show up to the forum. You could uh, start discussions. There's a lot of discussions about various topics. You should read through the rules. One of our rules to preserve intellectual integrity, of course, is that if a direct question is asked, that you have to answer it. You know, a lot of times when you're in debates, like the, I remember the debate between Bob Enyart and James White. James White just refused to answer questions. It's because his views... They're, they're contradictory and they don't make sense and he can't defend his views through use of questions. Questions are the ultimate way to get through an intellectual integrity, to get to the truth of a matter, to point out places where people are being silly or not making sense. This is not to say that there are some questions that just don't make sense at all. Like you can put string a bunch of words together and put a question mark on the end it doesn't make it a question. <clears throat> so there are nonsense questions, but uh, you know, trying to point out someone's contradiction in their thoughts, that, that's a perfectly valid way to question someone's beliefs. A real quick personal anecdote. I was debating this Calvinist once, and uh, I was like, can God's will be rejected? Because, of course, there's a famous text in which uh, that, that it says, the lawyers, which are the scribes, the people who know the Old Testament law, they rejected the will of God for themselves by not being baptized. 
These are lawyers, and they're rejecting God's will. And so it's funny. I asked the Calvinist, can God's will be rejected? And I, you don't want to necessarily be disingenuine. So you kind of post the text that you're referring to while you ask the question. And so not only does it show them what you're getting at, but it makes them very anxious to answer the question because um, the obvious answer is just sitting there right in front of them. But they don't want the obvious answer because their obvious answer is, you know, they, they have to reject the text to be consistent with their own theology. So he just tried to claim it was a trick question that wasn't an actual question. It's not a trick question when we're just exposing contradictions and absurdities in your belief. Answer the question. On that note, uh, the God is Open blog site, every Friday we try to do answered questions or unanswered questions. The answered questions are usually uh, like atheists or Calvinists or Arminians uh, asking questions either about God or about open theism. And then it's coupled with an open theistic answer to those questions. The unanswered questions, those are usually aimed at the Calvinist contingent or or the classical theist contingent, the Arminians who believe that God has some sort of exhaustive foreknowledge of the future. So on God is Open, we take questions very seriously. Questions are serious, and questions need to be answered if you're going to have a meaningful belief system, or if you want to have uh, an intelligent conversation where individuals aren't just talking past each other. And then you have to actually address the actual positions of your critics. So I hope you liked our introductory podcast. I hope it uh, gave you some value, kind of explained why we exist, what we stand for, and what we're hoping to achieve. If you have any questions or concerns about this, You could uh, post them. This will be added to the God is Open Facebook page. And it should also be linked to from the God is Open blog. Both places allows comments. The Facebook page is an open page, so if you're commenting there, it will be visible to all your friends. You might not want that. You might want to put that on the God is Open blog. Unless you and your friends like that sort of thing, then uh, go ahead and throw that on the Facebook page. We don't mind. We'll have a discussion with you. Uh, We'll try to be civil for the most part. Just read our forum rules, and that talks about how escalating conversations and types like that are handled on our webpage. I like our Facebook group, but I don't know. Maybe I got a personal bias. So I hope you guys do, too. I hope you like this podcast, and I will see you guys later. I was made to find you. I was made just for you.